What's up, Renegade Nation? Before we begin the video, I'd like to give a shout out to our most recent Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Michaela Chaperonova, Melvin1185, Jason Poole, Echo, not Gecko, Mr. Pyromaniac, Canadian Prime, Pizza Killer, Vadix, The Q651, Tools of Trypticon, Ethan Benson, Rodarius Franklin, Harry Naylor, Grimex Law 22, Demon Gamer 67, Anthony, Biz Roomba, Jennifer San Marco, HD Gamer, Lorenzo, Croc and Co, Abused Oreo, Cregan, The Texan Pybro, Phantom Pyralis, Iron Metallica, Zero Chaos, Hunter Tober McGivern, and I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our executive producers, The Anime Hybrid, Joshua Fix, The Oil Guy, and The Gimster 101. And I would also like to extend a big thank you to our new executive producer, Bevan Brummett. Thank you all very much for your support. If you want to become a YouTube member, hit the join button right down below next to the subscribe button. And if you want to become a member of Patreon, feel free to click the link down below in the description to find out more. We'll see you there. Uh-oh. Well, well I found a dead body. Um, that I did. <laughs> Again. Okay, I am not self-reporting. I swear to fucking God. No, Are you serious? You, I didn't suspect a thing. Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, just hit my microphone there. Didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah. So, some interesting things have happened over these last couple of weeks. Number one, uh, which was the one that worried me the most, Micah actually started back uh, at a full-time job. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much thrown recording sessions with him up in the air. We've managed to figure out a few things on when we can record with him, so hopefully going forward that that won't be a, uh, a massive issue. Uh, secondly, Nick and Chad both have resumed practicing with their respective bands. Now, they are still, you know, wearing masks, being socially distant, and all that, you know, being as safe as they can be, but you can only not be like if when you're a full-time musician like them uh, when you're full-time musicians like them you cannot stop yourself from especially if you're in a band i mean if you're a solo creator that's cool i mean i know you can do a lot from home but <clears throat> nothing beats that nothing beats that performing with your bandmates live and just that feeling that you get uh but um and also here recently I have incurred a type of foot injury. Not sure exactly what the hell happened, but this is my foot in uh, hot water and Epsom salt trying to get the pain to go away. And honestly, it's just been a whirlwind of a time trying to record videos and everything. And I've already stretched the the goodwill of the guys so far and I don't want to ask them to do any more than they than they can do because <clears throat> on top of everything going on Nick also edits for the channel and also Chad uh Chad's got a, a Chad and his uh I want to call her his fiance but they're not engaged yet or I don't know if they ever will be I mean they're they both anyway Chad has Nikki, who is, you know, his full-time girlfriend, and he is committed to the relationship with her 100%, which, you know, that's, you know, Chad, you know, I, and they're a great couple, but I, I just, I, I don't want to ask them any more than what they're capable of doing, so this is why I'm here solo, so I hope that this is, uh, I hope that this is palatable, I hope that this is okay, but, I figured uh, I'd try and do at least three or four videos here, and I'd see how I felt. Um, I love recording with the guys. I feel like the chemistry is a lot better whenever I have more people to play off of, but I just find that myself, I I don't have that much to, to contribute uh, by myself. So I figured what the hell, I'd uh, watch some Nostalgia Critic because it's been a while since we've done some Nostalgia Critic. And considering South Park just returned and has triggered literally everybody, 
well, not everybody. There's people out there who love what they do. But anyway, yeah, this is uh, the top 11 South Park episodes by the Nostalgia Critic. Let's get it up on screen and let's have us watch. Here we go. Oh, uh, that's an old intro. God. <laughs> All right. God. You know... Yeah, I know people don't like Doug, but there's no denying the impact he's had online. It's impossible at this point. So I haven't done a top 11 list in a while. <laughs> and so I thought I would do... Oh, I see what he's doing. Go ahead. Just say it. My top 11 favorite South Park episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna tell you right now, straightforward, there's a very strong chance that I will not have your favorite South Park episode on this list. And you know what? Who can blame me? It's fucking South Park! True. And that's really quite an accomplishment. With most shows people love, fans can usually pick their top 15 or even 20. But with South Park, it's like top 30 or top 50. That's how many good episodes there are. Yeah. And with them making their way up to their 17th season, they show... Now 21st season, which is... God, that's hard to imagine. Like, that's impossible to think about. Like, 21 seasons of South Park, and they are still pushing boundaries and pushing buttons and still just being ridiculously funny. But, yeah. No sign of getting less clever, less raunchy, and most importantly, less funny. They always know what mm -hmm. subject to tackle, how to tackle it, and how to get the biggest laugh. But inevitably, we have to ask which ones are the best. Which ones mm -hmm. stand out with the best jokes, best parodies, or even best messages. <laughs> They're tough to sort out, but I think I figured my top 11 favorite. My top 11? Because I like to go one step beyond. So, sit back and enjoy the top Every 11. Every time people like do a 10 to 11. In the whole wide world. <laughs> Christian Hard Rock. Oh, uh, growing in popularity. Yeah. There were still so many questions about what was <laughs> and what wasn't. What was harmful stealing and what was innocent fun? And this episode exposed a lot of mm. overhyped bullshit for what it was. The boys start their own band. Moop. <laughs> then decide to get online music for inspiration. Little did they know, though, that they were tapping into the worst crime humanity could possibly perform. At least, that's what the poor, starving musicians who already made millions of dollars say. Here you see the loving family of Master P. Next week is his son's birthday, and all he's ever wanted is an island in French Polynesia. So, he's gonna get it, right? I see an island without an owner. We're sorry, we'll, we'll never download music for free again. <laughs> the boys are so yeah. at what a terrible crime this is that they decide to stop oh, playing gosh. to protect their music and become symbols for other big-name artists who decide not to play. Mm. Never realizing that Cartman, who has started his own fake Christian rock band, which it turns out is very easy, all you do is replace the word girl and then a love song with God, is making tons of money because there's... Oh, boy. Yeah, so... Early 2000s, there was a huge influx in the music scene of, like, Christian metal, Christian hard rock, like, just more edgy versions of Christianity... Uh, and, yeah, uh, I remember when Evanescence was seen that, like, a lot of people, um, uh, in the Christian music circles saw Evanescence as a Christian rock band, which they clearly weren't. Um, and then, of course, same thing with Creed, because I remember when Creed released, uh, Human Clay, and they had, Can you take me higher? Yeah, um, Scott Stapp, <laughs> Jesus Christ, oh, that guy, but yeah, the whole thing with, uh, with, uh, and the thing is, um, 
a lot of people benefited from being seen as like a Christian rock band because, you know, Christian parents would buy the albums for their kids because their kids wanted to listen to stuff that was a little more like hardcore and edgy. Not to say that there isn't like good Christian rock and Christian metal out there. I've I've come, I've come across a few, and then of course there's the uh, there's Christian rap as well, which has been a whole thing. Uh, there's been a whole smorgasbord about that, but eh, enough enough about that. There's nobody else to listen to, forcing him to become a success while the other boys sit and do nothing, leaving them to sum up the position of any artist perfectly. But why play if we're not going to make millions of dollars? Because that's what real artists do. People are always going to find a way to copy our music and swap it for free. If we're real musicians, then we should just play and be stoked that so many people are listening. Besides, maybe mm. our songs would have gotten downloaded for free, but if they were good songs, then people still would have bought tickets to see our band in concert. We're not striking anymore! Who's with us? We're just about the money. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh. This episode not only has great commentary, but it's another example of keeping your eye off the prize and doing what you love simply because you love doing it. Hey, mm, with poorly that's written true. bill after poorly written bill trying to get passed in Congress to show the evils of the internet. I think this is an argument that won't be going away anytime soon. It's yeah. another great reminder to artists that if you're doing it for the money, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Man must learn mm. to think of these horrible outcomes before well. he acts selfishly or else recording artists will be forever doomed to a life of only semi-luxury. My whole thing is if I'm able to have... It, 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 that's the whole thing with me being on YouTube. I, I I don't do this for the money. I've, I've always done this to have fun, and I've always done this to interact and connect with people. As for instance, our Discord, which has, uh, has grown tremendously over the last few years and is now partnered officially with Discord, which, yeah, very happy about that. Uh, to our community manager uh, on there, Bone, good job, man. Thank you, thank you for all your hard work, really. But I don't do this for the money. It it helps. It helps to make life easier. I mean, hey, that's what you get when you live in a capitalist society. Which I'm a fan of capitalism, but again, you know, I my dad was my dad works in uh, trade skills. Like he can literally build your house from the ground up. He's a contractor through. And, <clears throat> through and through but you know me sitting here doing this i'm not really building anything except for like connections online and interacting with people so yeah i if i never make money like if i never make enough money to like live off of this 100 percent, i'm not i'm not overly worried but at the same time i cannot appreciate i cannot state enough the appreciation from all of you out there uh, who have uh, supported the channel throughout the years. Thank you so much. Number 10. Hey, 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 hey. Britney's new look. The oh. How much attention Britney Spears is getting. Yeah. Away. Interrupting political debates, important news stories. Yeah. And sucking every common person's attention. And the news about her is not really that interesting either. She just does something stupid that in no way affects the world. But the world, for some reason, thinks that it does. And they hunt her down, trying to exploit what a pathetic, blood-sucking creature she is, never realizing that they themselves are turning into the pathetic, blood-sucking creatures. Even after she pushes herself to the limit shooting herself, people still want to be in on the shit that nobody should care about. It talks about the obsession with celebrities our society has. Which we do. Asks the important question, who the fuck cares? There's no doubt yeah. that people love bullshit, but this episode says, for the love of God, get a fucking life and stop thinking how you can live through others. It's like that show, TMZ. You know, the... Oh, no. In the history of the human race. So he had to bring up TMZ. Because I feel like getting the footage is giving them a fraction of support, and that makes me feel like the devil. That fucking bad. And yet people still watch them like they're saying something important when all they're doing is praying somebody will blow their brains out to preserve whatever measly shreds of journalistic decency they have left. Jesus. This episode Quintana. exploits that showing when... No, oh, you know what? I'm going to go on a little longer. Fuck this show! <laughs> <laughs> without realizing it's sucking whatever intelligence you had. But you deserve your purgatory of rubbing tabloids on your genitalia thinking you're getting laid and claiming to others that you know how the world works while really you're just crying your virgin ass to sleep every night while eating your Dorito and Captain Crunch sandwiches. No, seriously, you stab God every time you see this show. You rape a kitten every time you don't turn the channel. Jesus. Fuck this show! Not a fan. 
This episode okay. displays a lot of similar issues that were also brought up in Raising the Bar. Oh, was a great the Honey episode. Boo Boo episode. I, I want that one! Shit, not only first, but better. For whatever reason, there will always be a crowd for this stupid stuff. And as long as there is, this episode will always hold relevance. Unlike some other pieces of shit. Seriously, whoever's watching it, sleep with something. For your own good. Or just go outside. That, that'd benefit them as well. No, At least I'd hope. Uh-oh. Cancelled. Shorty's, uh... <laughs> Uh-oh. I hear Shorty. Something, uh... Someone must be back home. Often shows the flaws of human nature, but once in a while it can get its humor from the idea that maybe we've been doing better than we thought. Like, we've actually yeah. been holding up when given the circumstances we're put in. And this episode plays around with that idea. I mean, I personally believe we it have. It starts off eerily similar to the very first episode. In fact, it's exact. Yeah. It wasn't a dream, Carmen. Those were visitors. No, it was just a dream. My mom said so. Visitors are real. They. Wait a minute. This has all happened before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This does seem really familiar. But then they realize they're reliving the same <laughs> events as before and discover that the aliens who implanted the satellite in him from the first episode have returned. This, of course, raises the question, why was the satellite there to begin with? Well, it turns out Earth is part of an intergalactic reality show. The idea Earth. around what happens when various people and animals all live on one planet. Our planet is just a reality TV show? Well, you don't think the whole universe works the way Earth does, do you? No! One species, one planet. There's a planet of deer, a planet of Asians, and so on. We put them all together on Earth, and the whole universe tunes in to watch the fun! This immediately creates conflict, college, drama, which of course equals entertainment. But yeah. the problem is people are suddenly made aware of its existence. So because of the fear of it not being as fun anymore, the show is in danger of being cancelled, resulting in Earth's destruction. So the boys mm. had to convince the aliens that mankind is still violent, still crazy, and still has the need to keep world peace as far away from them as possible. So they can be renewed oh, for season God. and the earth doesn't have to be destroyed. They had to promote <laughs> the worst of humanity in order to save the best of <laughs> Not only is it a great callback to the first episode, but it's also both the most optimistic and pessimistic combination you can imagine. Turning the mere act of yeah. existing into a form of business and entertainment. This episode shows clearly not only what's good TV, <laughs> but what keeps it good TV. I'm sure you'll see that if you give our world time, it will become even more outrageous and violent. You know... I would say... Outrageous? Yeah. Violent. Throughout history, humanity has had a very, very violent streak, but... Nowhere near as bad as we have been. <laughs> I mean, we've been, like, terrible, terrible in the past. I'd say we're we're fairly apathetic, but we're nowhere near as, like, monstrous as we used to be in terms of, like, like, like horrible things happening. But we have become more outrageous because social media has literally turned everything into a thought chamber. Let's face it, when uh -oh. love It's my mama. I'll be right back. Hello? Hey, you want me to bring you something to eat? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I had me, I still have food here that I was able to make. Okay. Well, I'm leaving. All right, I'll see you here in a few. Okay, I love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. So I got that to look forward to. My mom's coming over to bring me, uh, like a... Some sort of wrap for my foot that's supposed to help out. It's uh, so I guess we'll see how that goes. But yeah, that's uh, that's what's going on. So till she gets here, I'm gonna try and fin try and do as much of this as I can. I know she'll get here before I finish, but I will. Pokemon, or just didn't fucking understand it. There was no ignoring the impact that it was having. Kids yeah. became obsessed, making the anime damn 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 in the past. So this is Trey and Matt's very adult outsider <clears throat> look on the phenomenon. And as someone who's going into college by the time this shit became popular and didn't follow it at all, I can guarantee it got most people's reaction to it. Now you can collect them all. Furry cat, donkey drum, penguin, shoe, lamb toy. Collect them all and you can become <laughs> shoe. Shoe. 
Also, it helps. Also, it helps that Trey Parker knows how to speak full Japanese. Um, uh, so he, I think he understands like where he's immersed himself in Japanese culture and actually learned how to speak Japanese. He can sort of be like an insider on the whole on the whole Chin Pokemon, or not, see, I just said the whole Pokemon phase that happened when it first blew up here in the West. But yeah, anyway understand the show and why it's so damn weird. The parents discover a plot from the Japanese to brainwash all of America's kids, forming an army to conquer the world. This not only mocks the intense fandom of children and but also how diabolical marketing can be. And that with the right combination of crazy and can form an empire of epic proportions. Even to world domination, apparently. Just look at this subtle propaganda. <laughs> it's just a great what the fuck reaction to all the adults trying to understand what their kids are watching. And that as much as we like to push good intelligent programming on them, kids are always gonna like something stupid too. Mm. It's just the yeah. way of life. Someday I will collect all the Chimpokemon, then I will fight the evil power that will reveal itself once all the Chimpokemon are collected. Oh. oh? No kidding, you can't have these chicken tenders because they are mine and I keep mine to myself. Uh -huh. It was great seeing the oddness of children's animation. Get us on son? Is that Garrison son, 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 damn it? <laughs> Oh no. Number seven. Good times with weapons. For as much as they mock the kids' <laughs> anime, it's fairly obvious the writers of the show must enjoy good adult anime as well. Yeah. In this episode, the boys come across a series of weapons and pretend that they're ninjas. But not just any ninjas, anime ninjas. Yeah. And the best thing is we don't see it from an outsider point of view like we did with Japokemon. We see it from the children's point of view. Everything found in traditional anime is here. The badass designs, the over-the-top storylines, even the karaoke songs with bad English dubbing. Yeah. Protect my balls! <laughs> a lot of the humor comes from the fact that it's taking a similar story about kids playing and turning oh, it into God. a grand battle. So the comedy lies in how over the top and epic they're making their childish dilemmas. Yeah. It does over the top and epic like anime. Oh it's my gosh. With lots of laughs and a perfect satire of a very popular art. We'd love to hang out guys, but we have important secret work to do. Yes, the life of a ninja is complex and full of pain. It even has a funny little jab at the end about violence in the media versus sex in the media. And yeah. The but hell, we all know that wasn't the best part. The best part was just watching them make fun of what we enjoy, but still in a loving way. Yeah. What can you say, but let's fight fighting now. Rob. Let's fighting Rob. Let's, let's fighting Rob. Gosh. Number six. Make love. Oh, yes! Oh, uh, World of Warcraft so episode, oh one gosh. Of the most popular, if not the most popular RPG ever, Warcraft. <laughs> the boys all discover Warcraft and become instantly hooked. The only downside is there's one player out there who has spent God knows how many hours building up his experience points, making him the most powerful oh, character gosh. in the game, allowing him to kill and bully whoever he wants. This pisses off the boys to no end. So they decide they want to get revenge. But the only way to do it is to build up their experience points. So the boys decide to sacrifice all their social life to become the mightiest fighters online and the and most pathetic yeah. most in reality. Much like good times with weapons, a lot of the humor oh comes God. from how epically large our heroes can make something so not epically large. I mean, they can be fighting online, but when you get down to it, they're just sitting at a fucking computer screen. And we always get constant reminders seeing all our badass looking characters still have the voices of little kids. <laughs> I just took the biggest, biggest dick crap. Dude, we've been waiting forever. Well, I'm sorry I had to take a dump. Another great thing about this episode is that so much of it is done in CG and actually acquired the help of Blizzard Entertainment, the company that That's made cool. Warcraft. Again, like Good Times with Weapons, though, the episode mocks the material as well as its fans, but also shows the appreciation for it, too. It acknowledges why the game is so popular and how it can become so addictive. It just shows what happens when the addiction can go too far. Whoever this person is, he has played World of Warcraft nearly every hour of every day for the past year and a half. We are dealing with someone here who 
has absolutely no life. Year and a Hold half. on. Weird. Hmm. Looks like Boogie. Not gonna lie. The bald head, except, except the bald head, because Boogie ain't bald. Looks a lot like Boogie 2988. Just putting that out there. Dealing with someone here who has absolutely, absolutely no, no life. life. How do you kill that, that which, which has, has no, no life. life? But it still shows it as fun. And even though people Greg, use your crossbow. It's extremes. There's still something very oh, it's Clyde. About it. Dad, how did you get that? No, Dad, Dad, move. Just yeah, take, take it. it. Here. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you hand something from one player to another? Mm. Bring up your inventory screen. Noobs. Okay. okay. So again, we have a <laughs> Obviously taking a few punches here and there. I don't have a World of Warcraft account, do you? No, no. I have a life. But still enjoying the fact that something so mundane can be turned into such a huge adventure. It has a perfect understanding of the fans, the material, and even the idea behind the material. Hey, if even Blizzard can acknowledge how funny it is, it must be doing something right. No! Yeah. I don't want him to start over the graveyard! No! Ah! God f***ing damn it! Can't tell you how many times I've... Uh, I've been there myself a few times, but I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people Passion be in that. The Jew. Definitely a oh. The best look at Mel Gibson's controversial film, The Passion of the Christ. Some people may forget, but this film was one of the most talked about movies for a couple years. Yeah. And so decided to throw in their two cents as well. All the boys go to see the film based on how everybody's been talking about it. In a post-9-11 world. A different reaction. Kyle sees it as a guilt trip because... Yeah, in a post-9-11 world, when The Passion of the Christ came out, everyone went and saw it to sort of see, you know, have a visual reference and a representation of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. But in turn, it, it was used as a propaganda tool to the extent of where it was absolutely ridiculous. I remember, actually, real quick, real quick on this, and then I'll move on. I remember near my hometown, there was this ministry that went out and bought this huge uh, air, like, uh, tent that was held up by a uh, air, uh, an air propulsion unit, which was on the side, and, you know, you ran it, and the tent was massive, and they rented it out so that they could, uh, uh, they no, they bought it because they wanted people to come in and see... The Passion of the Christ. They actually got uh, a lot of the rights to uh, to play it at this church in this big uh, this big tent, and they did it. They did it, and the problem was, after they did it, it was so successful that they were just like, "Oh wow, we could just keep doing this." And eventually, they did it, and they tried to play other movies, but they found getting the rights and licenses to do movies like that, especially those that had. A lot of big bucks behind it and weren't as open to sharing. Uh, didn't want that. So they wound up uh, spending all their money trying to keep that place going. And eventually the ministry shut down because of it. So there's people who jumped into the deep end on the Passion of the Christ way too heavily. Including Mel Gibson. Which the dude made a buku amounts of money off of... The Passion of the Christ. I mean, he donated a lot to, chur to churches and charities, but still, it it was hell. And also, the fact that they're doing the resurrection of the Christ with Mel Gibson coming back as to direct and Jim Caviezel coming back as Jesus Christ, I think that's actually pretty cool. Uh, I think maybe effectively that'll be like a a feel good movie. Whereas this, whereas the Passion of the Christ was just, whew, that was hard to watch. Of his Jewish heritage, Cartman sees it as a chance to control brainwashed extremists. Also, also, I don't know why. As... Also, I don't know why Jewish people would feel guilty about killing Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't a Christian; he was Jewish. That yeah, so, I don't understand the guilt there. That's all I'm saying. No, not bad, Plus, it wasn't the, just wasn't the Jews that, that it wasn't the Jews though. that killed would Christ. It was it, it was everybody. It was the Jews. It was the Romans. It was. Just like when we got our money back for basketball. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thing is, I like basketball. It's okay. Are sadly confirmed. In fact, overly confirmed. I guess now you're gonna start torturing me. Oh, my nipples are so tender. Don't squeeze them anymore. Dude, what's wrong with him? He's cuckoo, dude. 
It addressed every issue that people <laughs> talked about with the film. Uh, Anti-Semitism, Jewish guilt, the overuse of violence, religious extremes, focus of faith, and just how uh, bad shit and say Mel Gibson is, even before it was commonly known today. It seems like this episode was trying to do what most of their episodes <laughs> Oh, tried. gosh. Mock over the top Give back my $18! Ironically, <laughs> over the top extremes. <laughs> But their extremes served as a mirror to all the other complainers, saying, hey, if you're going to preach something, make sure it's something that's good. Or, as they say it, If you want to be Christian, that's cool, but you should follow what Jesus taught instead of how he got killed. Focusing on how he got killed is what people did in the Dark Ages, and it ends up with really bad results. He's right. That about sums it up. Because when you get down to it, they don't attack how people represent religion and faith. They attack how people declare a movie represents religion and faith. And how that's just as much bullshit as it sounds. Yes. And this episode called it out. Whatever your thoughts, whatever your beliefs, make sure you're following good ethics for good reasons. Mm -hmm. You would all love to torture me, wouldn't you? He's not quite as eloquent as I had pictured. Only four more to go and we'll get no. more right after these ads. So, keep an eye out for this one. It's Saturday and Sunday. You can't wait to go! I don't trust it. I don't trust it either. Yeah, well. And no ads, because I got YouTube Red. Yeah. Is it wrong to count three episodes as one? Fuck it, I'm doing it. Anyway. Nah. Let's move on to number four. I think if it tells a continuous story, I think it's okay to count it all as one. The Coon Trilogy. <laughs> yeah, even though The Coon made a few appearances before, uh, you all know which episodes I'm talking about. The Cthulhu episode. Yeah. That's right. This is a three-parter with episodes Kuhn 2 Hindsight, Hysteria and Rises, and Kuhn vs. Kuhn and Friends. They're split into threes and for good reason. So much happens that it needs to be split into three. But they yes. they flow perfectly as one. The trilogy starts with Cartman as a superhero character called the Kuhn, being thrown out of his superhero group Kuhn and Friends because... Well, he's Cartman and he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. But as luck would have it, a BP drill goes AWOL again and accidentally unleashes Cthulhu. But don't worry, <sighs> they apologize for it. Sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. Sorry. Cartman takes his chance to befriend Cthulhu and take his revenge out on his friends. While that's happening, there's epic drama going on with one of the team members, Mysterion, trying to discover his origin. There's also great appearances from characters like Captain Hindsight, Professor Chaos, and of course, Mint Berry Crunch. Yeah. Where do I begin with this episode? Not only does it satirize everything from comic books to anime to current events to fucking Chuck Jones cartoons, but yeah. it surprisingly also stands on its own as a very good story. At least from a comedic standpoint. There's good twists, mysteries, and reveals all throughout the three episodes. Even down to which kid is playing which superhero. Even that gets a huge laugh. And sometimes, as with Mysterion, <laughs> it ties into the story. The exposition at the end about one of the oh. characters' background is so funny and so unexpected, it's impossible not to laugh your ass off. The way it can act so large when such silly, ridiculous stuff is going on is an epic comedy marvel. It <laughs> blends styles and mixes genres to create its own little epic. I know many people would probably prefer the Imagination Land saga, and yeah, that was pretty funny too, but this one seemed to have a more defined look with harsher shadows and backgrounds. Only reason, actually... I think I count myself as like the one of the people who would prefer the Imagination Land trilogy. Don't get me wrong, I love the the Coon trilogy, but I don't know. Just seeing all those characters on screen and also the return of uh, the the little uh, the <laughs> the little critters, uh, the evil little critters. Uh, also, uh, just the ridiculousness of Imagination Land. I I would say I prefer Imagination Land trilogy over the Coon trilogy. Just and I know that this includes Cthulhu, but I don't know. I just prefer I just prefer the uh, the Imagination Land trilogy. That's it. And also, in my opinion, just funnier jokes and more character. Out of all the really <clears throat> big action-packed episodes they've ever done, this one not only seemed the biggest, but the best put together. It had action. It had drama. It had questions. It had answers. It left everybody satisfied. The one very important question remains. Why the hell isn't there a Midberry Crunch cereal? Seriously, it advertises itself. Can we get a Kickstarter for this? 
Yeah. Hey, Trey and Matt, make that a thing. I guarantee you people would sign up for it. Mintberry Crunch. Oh. <laughs> Antichrist. This episode gets heavy. <laughs> it gets fucked up. It goes from zero to a hundred so fast. The humor does oh God! Twists and turns and throws at you, especially since it's around Stan, who one Christmas comes across a series of talking animals called the Woodland Critters. They're excited because Porcupine, the Porcupine, isn't that great name, is giving birth to the Lord and Savior. Chickadee, honestly, the chickadee. Yeah, you should just stop right there. If I was to talk any more about the story, it would give away great reveal after great reveal. <laughs> and needless to say, every single one of them gets a huge laugh. It's not just a great satire of Christmas specials. Yeah. Even that music seems to sum up every Christmas song ever made. It's once a year, it's Christmas time. Yeah. Once a year. But as stories go, this one is probably the best written. There are so many surprises around every corner, and each of them gets funnier than the last. And every single time you think they're done with the comedic payoffs, they always have at least five other ready for you. And they all tie in to make an absolutely perfect episode. I know I'm being really vague about it, but trust me, if you've seen this episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. When you hear South Park does a Christmas special, this is just the kind of stuff that would pop in your head. Shocking, dark, in bad taste, but also so unbelievably funny. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh-oh. It's a shorty boy. Hey, shorty. Come here. Come here, you big lummox. How's your foot? I'm soaking it in Epsom salt right now. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Chad... Chad's done his damnedest to try and be more available. It's just I don't want to overburden him because that's that's one thing that just I, I don't want people to burn out. I don't want people to feel like they can't do what they want. I just want Chad to be able to to do as he pleases and be a part of and be a part of this as much as he can, but I don't want to put too much on it. Sorry. Anyway, back to it. I can't go into more detail like I did the other ones, especially when you're so high up on the list. But I really do believe that the reveal of the humor is that good. And I simply don't <laughs> want to ruin it for you. It's one of my favorite Christmas specials for that very reason, and I think it's some of South Park's greatest writing. Oh my gosh. Number two. What do we got? All about Oh. I think it's safe to say the creators of South Park have a fascination with Mormons. But given the way they explain yeah. it and make jokes about it, you can kind of see why. In this episode, a family of Mormons move into the neighborhood. At first, they're outcasts because everyone thinks they're going to try and force their beliefs down their throats. As the town's preparing for a fight, the Mormons are preparing for dinner. Yeah, yeah. not only do they not want to fight back, but they constantly invite people over for dinner. And it's not for any religious agenda or anything. They're just nice. What happened? I'm going over to his house for dinner tonight. You kicked Mr. Harrison's ass? We're uh, having their family over for dinner tomorrow night. See, that's what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've actually, like, there's a few people I know in this area who are Mormons. And for the most part, this is entirely too accurate. Um... Now, don't get me wrong, there's one or two that are a little overbearing, a little overzealous, just... But at the same time, most Mormons I've met have been extremely just nice, cordial. And that doesn't mean that there aren't bad Mormons. I mean, of course, there's there's bad people in every belief system out there, and there's bad people everywhere. But, again, it points out the fact about religion that I've, I've always tried to help hold in earnest is that religion is an individual's like beliefs how an individual comes to their conclusions or wants to believe or wants to 
wants to live their life is up to them. And as long as they're not hurting anybody, who cares? That's, that's, I, I know some people would be like, it holds back the, you know, the, the intelligence of humanity, you know, if religion is still present. And I'm like, but dude, you don't have the right to tell people what they can and cannot believe. If they're not hurting anybody, who cares? I've always held firm in that. That's what my, that's what my pastor taught me, how my pastor taught me to be. I was taught not to judge people. And this is a perfect example of how not to judge people and how to hold people and not how to hold people to a standard because, you know, you're afraid of zealots. But anyway. Talk politely, they tell stories, they're a better family than most of the families in town. And the episode is pretty much the village's confusion of how such kind people can come from a religion that's, well, according to South Park, something like this. Jesus lived here in America? Yes, eventually my people were all killed by the other tribe of Israel. And as punishment, God turned their skin red. These are the Native Americans you know today. Dum, 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 dum. This episode is one of the best for two reasons. One, if you've ever known a Mormon, you know they are unusually nice and ethical and not angry and just pleasant. pleasant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's some <laughs> asshole Mormons out there, but I haven't met them yet. I haven't even met a person who met a Mormon who was an asshole yet. So the grab I've, of I've met one or two is not only funny, but kind of dead on. But the second thing that makes this episode one of the best is that it still takes its shots at the Mormon religion. But that still doesn't get in the way of their message. Being that if a religion doesn't spread hate, produces good people, and hurts no one, who cares what the hell they think? In my opinion, I don't even think this needs to be called All About Mormons. It could be called All, all About Religion. Yeah. No matter what the yeah. faith, if it seems to spread good without <clears> hurting <throat> soul, I'm... there's good in it. As much as the episode does mock the Mormon religion, it also surprisingly teaches tolerance in its own unique South Parky way. <laughs> Stan's father wants to become a Mormon because he just wants to figure out how he can be as nice and complete as that family is. And it all comes from just being pleasant. And you know what? In a show that can be so harsh and mean-spirited sometimes, it's good to know that even the creators can still see the value in just straight up being nice. Even in the face of being mocked for it. And in the end, the Mormon kid is actually seen as the badass because he didn't change for anything. He just stayed himself because that's what he liked. In a time where religion can still be so complicated and so controversial, this episode understands that sometimes the simplest answer can very well be the best. Who's up for a water balloon fight? Yeah! 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 Aw. And now for my number one pick. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Keep an open mind. The number one best South Park episode is Osama bin Laden has farty pants. What? Hold it! Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. So. <laughs> That's a hell of a freeze frame on Rachel. Um, okay, so... I remember that episode. I think that was the... Yeah, that was the one right after 9-11. That was just... That one was, was tough, man. That one was a, a tough watch, but at the same time, I couldn't help but laugh because it just... <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, I, I'm... I want to know what, I wonder what Doug's going to say. So let me explain the reason why I think this is the best episode. It's not the funniest episode. It's not the smartest episode. It's not even the best written episode. Hmm. But it came at a time when America needed South Park. It had been three hmm. months since the previous South Park episode, and in that time, not only did 9-11 happen, but a series of yeah. anthrax attacks that was being sent through the mail was putting the country in a state of absolute fear. Security tightened everywhere, our country was on the brink of war, oh, God. America was changed forever. Nobody knew how or what to feel. So when the news that South Park was going to return to TV was announced, a lot of people were wondering, what are they going to do? What could they do? 
Would it be a touching episode? An in-depth episode? What side would they pick? What issues were they going to tackle? What the hell was South Park going to do? Literally, the first frame set the mood. <laughs> Remember when life used to be simple and cool? Not really. This is what we needed. We needed a good laugh at yeah. the entire thing, and we needed it to be... You know, that's actually kind of reticent of of today. Because the whole anthrax thing, you know, and the whole anthrax panic and all that. There were, there were people who got hurt by anthrax, but... Uh, uh oh, my mom's here, so uh, I will be right back. A few moments later. Hello again, Internet Faithful. How are you doing? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, my mom just came by, and <clears throat> she dropped off, or actually, she gave me an ace bandage. <clears throat> she wrapped my foot and my ankle for support and for uh, to keep the pressure off of it, so... Yeah, uh, and also, <clears throat> if things do not get better by tomorrow, I'm going to go see a doctor. The odds are it's a pinched nerve or micro fractures in my foot. I think it's a pinched nerve, honestly, because I haven't done anything really, well, outside of, like, trying to run and trying to be a little more physically, trying to be more physically active. <clears throat> Other than that, uh, nothing, I, I haven't really done anything too strenuous. But anyway, uh, got to finish this video, so back to it. <clears throat> we needed a good laugh at the entire <coughs> time, and we needed it to be done by South Park. The episode shows the overly secured and paranoid America waving flags everywhere for support and hiding in their homes, feeding their fear by watching the news. Through a misunderstanding, the boys are forced to send a dollar each to Afghanistan kids as part of a charity program, and they in return send a goat. They don't want the goat though, and wish to return it via plane, but end up getting caught in the flight. Through, per usual, a strange series of events, the boys end up discovering Osama Bin Laden. And the rest of the show is just making him look like the most pathetic ass. It was as over the top, raunchy, <laughs> silly, and cartoony as they had ever been in the past. <laughs> oh! I got him! I got him! Everybody was talking about it the next day. Did you see that episode of South Park? <coughs> Wasn't it hilarious? That was just what I needed. God, I'm glad they're still so funny. There have been jokes made about the state of our country before this episode, other mm -hmm. satires and commentaries, but this was the one that Americans needed. Uncompromising, unapologetic, not worrying about who they offended, just trying to make people laugh. It was just the right jokes at just the right time delivered by just the right people. Giuliani showed us we needed to be strong, Letterman mm -hmm. showed us we needed to cry, South Park showed us we needed to laugh. Yes. I'm not going to say it changed everything or erased all our fears that we had before, but a good comedian knows the power of laughing and how important it is. It not only makes you feel good, but it can help you out through some of the darkest moments of your life. And in one of America's darkest moments, this helped a great deal. It helped us in only the strange way South Park can help us. By not backing down to anything and just doing what they thought was funny. And whether it was a huge roar or the tiniest little chuckle, everybody felt their spirits raise a little bit after seeing this episode. It's the best episode because it's the only episode that reminds us that we not only like South Park, but we surprisingly need it. Hmm. So there you go, my top 11 favorite South Park episodes. And looking back, it's kind of shocking how smart it is. From a show that most people thought was just low-brow garbage and crude child issues, <coughs> South Park has proven to be some great social satire, and purely mm -hmm. on its own terms. They're the people we can always rely on to say the Emperor has no clothes. The people who won't be bought out or cave in to any public opinion. The people who won't hold back about saying something about somebody because they're afraid that they might be on the show or they might be a sponsor. They have no fear because they have no cares. They talk about whatever they think is funny and still manage to be relevant for 17 seasons and still going strong. Yeah. Maybe there is more to South Park than just crude humor. 
Maybe it's proof that great comedy and art doesn't just come from freedom, but from freedom given to the right people. And that what the public claims as one day being beneath them, or immature nonsense, can the next day be claimed as some of the most blunt, straightforward, and brilliant satire that television has seen in years. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, you can't, man, you can't. Okay. I'm the nostalgia critic. I remember it, so you didn't have to. This alternative. <coughs> he turned into freaking Cartman. Uh, Uncle Yo. Yeah, it's, I wonder. I was wondering who that was. Uh, the uh, the other guy uh, with the. Uh, with, uh, with uh, <laughs> the other guy with the, the glasses. <clears throat> Not that guy with the glasses, but the other guy with the glasses. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, basically, yeah. Top 11 South Park episodes. Holy shit. So, <clears throat> so overall, this has been, like, like South Park has been in the forefront of parody because a lot of people still to this day are trying to get the show canceled. There's like, it's outrageous. It's terrible. It's awful. To which, uh, comedy central is just like, yeah, that's kind of the point. <clears throat> so anyway, all, all together with uh, everything South park has, like has going on still, I mean, they just did the pandemic episode, which was an hour long. Sorry, have a have a gnat in here. <clears throat> but overall, because of that, and because of um, because of cancel culture being at an all time high, they added in a, a character PC Principal, who was awesome. Uh, he just represented everything like dude bro, like dude bro cancel culture was. And also, now that they've actually have gone and have started telling more concurrent stories throughout, it's actually it's actually helped the I think it's helped the show maintain its relevance because if they just did like the episodic thing, like just the anthological anthological episodic thing every like, then the show would get boring. <coughs> But thankfully, uh, they haven't done that. Thankfully, they've stuck to their guns and they've they've done what they wanted. So, again, love South Park, love South Park to death. And the more to it, uh, the more the longer it's on TV, the happier I'll be. But anyway, um, yeah, I guess until next time, everybody. That's gonna do it. So signing off. I'm Nate. We are the Renegades, and we will see you then, everybody. Peace out. <laughs>